So now it is my pleasure to introduce Anne Martel. Anne is my go-to person whenever I have AI-related questions. Uh, she is the, uh, the perfect person to moderate this session. Uh, Anne is a senior scientist at the Sunnybrook Research Institute, uh, professor in medical biophysics at the University of Toronto, and a Vector Institute faculty affiliate. Uh, her research is focused on artificial intelligence uh, as it applies to medical image analysis uh, and is also a, uh, an entrepreneur, uh, having created uh, PathCore, which is uh, one of the companies uh, that has received funding through the Innovate pilot stage. So Anne, I will, uh, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, so thanks Raphael, and thank you to Innovate for setting up this panel discussion. So our objective here is to discuss uh, things to do with AI and the medtech ecosystem. And I'm very pleased to introduce an outstanding panel of experts here. So hopefully we can cover every kind of eventuality. So we have Ad Azra Dalla, she is the Director of Health AI Implementation at the Vector Institute, one of Canada's leading institutes dedicated to research in the area of artificial intelligence. Uh, she's responsible for driving health AI deployment with the Ontario healthcare system in order to improve patient outcomes and healthcare delivery. Azra has got over a decade of experience at the intersection of healthcare and technology and has worked with globally recognized leaders such as the SickKids Center for Global and Child Health, the University Health Network and the Aga Khan Development Network. So welcome Azra. And we also have Karen McClure from the um, Digital Supercluster. She's the Chief Investment Officer of Canada's Digital Technology Supercluster and oversees the evaluation, selection and performance of over $350 million portfolio of investments in the digital technology in innovation sector. She's held several healthcare leadership roles in both public and private sector over the last 20 years and is passionate about leveraging data and technology to build a sustainable, high quality and patient-centered healthcare ecosystem now and for generations to come. So welcome, Karen. Uh, and last but not least, we have Ross Mitchell, who's recently returned to Canada from his sojourn in the US. He's the inaugural Alberta Health Sciences Chair in Artificial Intelligence and Health at the University of Alberta, and a fellow of the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, AMI, which is the sister institute to, to Vector and um, Mila, sorry, nearly forgot that. Uh, Ross is also a professor in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta and is a senior program director of the Artificial Intelligence Adoption. So from 2019 to 2021, he was the inaugural AI officer at the Moffitt Cancer Center and um, Research Institute in Tampa, Florida. And then from 2011 and 2019, he was a professor of radiology at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. So welcome, Ross. So we're going to kick off, first of all, we're going to go around our participants so they can give you a little bit more detail about who they are and what they're interested in things. So Azra, do you want to kick off? Sorry, I had a problem unmuting myself there for a second. But yes, thank you so much, Anne, for that wonderful introduction. And good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am thrilled to be participating with this uh, amazing panel, these amazing panelists. Um, my name is Azra Dal. I'm the Director of Health AI Implementation at the Vector Institute. Uh, and as part of my portfolio, I lead the identification, implementation, and scaling of AI initiatives uh, within various healthcare settings, be them healthcare agencies, public health settings, as well as hospitals. Uh, the second part of my portfolio is I also work on capacity building initiatives for health service providers, uh, knowing that there's a gap uh, in terms of AI data literacy, uh, being one of the barriers to implementation uh, of AI solutions. Uh, my portfolio also focuses on building the, the tool set and the skill set of our, our service providers, be them clinicians or healthcare leaders, to provide them with the tools that they need to not only be able to understand the theoretical aspects of AI, but also application within the clinical setting. So uh, I'm thrilled to be here today and, and to share some of my experiences uh, on the implementation front. And I guess I'll pass it uh, back to you, Anne. And um, thank you very much. So Karen, would you like to introduce yourself in the supercluster? Sure, thank you very much and good afternoon. And if anybody's on the West Coast, good morning still. Um, I'm honored to be here today to join uh, these panelists. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Digital Technology Supercluster, we're an independent not-for-profit organization 
that stewards uh, primarily government funds, uh, federal government funds, uh, to invest those funds in digital technologies um, and to help Canadian businesses, particularly small and medium-sized businesses, uh, grow in Canada and stay in Canada. So the IP that is generated from these projects um, is intended to stay in Canada and deliver both social and economic benefit to Canada and Canadians. So uh, right now we have over 1,100 organizations from across the country who are part of our supercluster. And as Anne mentioned, we've invested over $350 million in digital technology. About 60% of that, or about close to $200 million, has been invested in digital health technologies uh, across 40 different projects. Um, you know, we have a few principles that we, we apply. So first of all, as I mentioned, we're, you know, our overall purpose is to help Canadian businesses grow um, and ideally uh, stay in Canada and grow in Canada and not be acquired by a foreign entity um, and to deliver social and economic benefits to Canadians uh, through the use of digital technology. Uh, the principles are collaboration. And so this is bringing industry, academia, and government to the table to work together to do things they otherwise wouldn't be able to do on their own and to de-risk the R&D investment uh, of each of the organizations. Second principle, uh, and it's industry-led. And so second principle is co-investment. Um, and so industry puts their dollars in first and then we reimburse them for some of their expenses after they do what they say they're going to do. Um, and so it's not a grant kind of a program. It's really focused on, uh, you know, really delivering products and services um, that are going to be uh, commercially successful, which is the third principle. This is around commercial success, helping Canadian businesses grow, scale, stay in Canada. And so we're looking for strong products um, that will be commercially successful both inside and outside of Canada. And as part of that, we require that target customers participate in all of these R&D projects to ensure there's a product market fit, fit and to uh, demonstrate uh, the, the benefits of these technologies through the development process without any obligation for procurement. And so hopefully, obviously, the hope is that the, this R&D is successful and that um, Canadian or healthcare organizations will procure the technology but they can participate in, in projects without that obligation. So, um, you know, many of the, the organizations that are part of Innovate have participated in projects. You know, we've got a number of organizations that have showcased their strengths in AI and machine learning and uh, have demonstrated they have the experience and capacity to generate some real high quality commercial momentum to advance AI and health. And as, the, as time goes on today, hopefully we can showcase some of those uh, efforts and talk about where we've, we've uh, seen momentum in terms of investment. Thank you. Great, right, thanks, Karen. And Ross, do you want to introduce your plans for Alberta? Sure. So I'm just uh, recently returned to Canada. I arrived in the middle of December. Uh, I went from flip-flops in Tampa Airport to about minus 40 in Edmonton Airport. So that was a real uh, initiation. But I grew up in Saskatchewan, so I'm, but if you if you don't if you're not in it, you lose it, so to speak. So it was quite a shock. But uh, I'm quite happy to come back to Canada, primarily because of the public health care system. I spent 11 years in the U.S. Um, at Mayo Clinic and Moffitt. Um, Moffitt is uh, the third largest cancer center in the U.S. by patient volume. Um, and the largest cancer center in Florida. <clears throat> and Florida has a population of about 23 million. So they're quite a busy cancer center. Um, but uh, what attracted me to come back was the opportunity to do something that I don't believe can be done in the US. And that is to train models with population-based, truly population-based uh, data. So in Alberta, they are in the process of rolling out an EPIC system. They call it Connect Care. Um, I don't know how much they spent, well over a billion dollars, and this will be um, provincial. So Alberta Health Services is the, they claim to be the first and largest provincial healthcare system in Canada, and they uh, do everything above the level of primary care. So they have like um, 106 hospitals, 
30,000 continuing care beds, 8,500 acute care beds, almost 3,000 mental health beds, five psychiatric hospitals, 11,000 physicians, and 120,000 employees. And all that, and they provide service to four and a half million people uh, across the lifetime. And all of that data is in Connect Care. So you have one database that follows the lifespan of four and a half million individuals from birth to death, essentially, um, and uh, is linked to every other uh, government database, uh, like social databases and criminal databases and things like that in the province. So it gives an opportunity to um, do some really interesting and powerful things if we can get access to the data, there's always that. So my uh, role, what I negotiated with them was um, three appointments. So the first one is as an artificial intelligence scientist in Amy, the um, equivalent to the Vector Institute, the Alberta Machine, Inst uh, Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, and computer science. I have an appointment in computer science in Amy. My primary appointment is in the faculty of medicine, um, and that's critical to span AI in medicine. And my third appointment is in Alberta Health Services, and that is a clinical uh, role. And uh, senior program director means that I'm in charge of AI across the province for Alberta Health Services. So the, the anything to do with AI in Alberta will um, involve um, me to some extent. Although right now I would say I'm primarily just a consultant for them. I do a lot of consulting on uh, plans and trying to help them get up to get up to speed on what they're going to need to do to actually deploy AI. And uh, my uh, vision in Alberta is to build essentially what I call a skunk works on the uh, clinical side of the great divide or the fence that separates research from um, clinical deployment. For many, many years, um, uh, typically when a, well, we'll get into this later, but I think it's really critical to be on the uh, clinical side of the fence. So, uh, for example, when I was at Moffitt, I had a, a project I was doing with natural language processing and I asked for digital pathology reports and the database of men I was working with said, how many? And I said, all of them. And seven days later, I had half a million digital pathology reports. That's what you get when you're on that side of the fence because it's a quality project, not a research project, no IRB. You can later turn it back into research and translate the other way by going through IRB and applying for the right to say, submit an abstract or publish a paper. So that's the goal is to do all our research in quality improvement on the quality improvement side of the fence and get unfettered access to all the data on four and a half million people. Okay, sounds like fun. <laughs> okay, so what I'd like to do, I've got, we've got some prepared questions here. So we're gonna go through the prepared questions and, and give everyone on the panel a chance to yeah. weigh in. Uh, I'd like to encourage the audience to, if you want to sort of intersperse or ask any questions of anyone on the panel at any point, just put up your hand. Um, hopefully I will see your hand go up on the participants list and I can hopefully promote your video and, and, and give you a chance to speak, okay? So, so I'm gonna kick off with some of the prepared questions first. Um, so the first question um, was, what do you think are the main areas of opportunity for AI and med tech and, and where are the low hanging fruit? So what areas do you see developing First, and then what areas do you see developing over a, a longer time frame? So, Karen, you're going to go up first on this one. Yeah, sure. So, what we've seen um, industry being interested in investing in is, um, first of all, imaging uh, based clinical decision support tools. That's the reason most of these organizations are here today. Um, but that is that is where we're seeing most of the investment um, and adoption in terms of uh, deployment at this point in time. Um, what we're also starting to see is investment, digital technologies and AI to support people staying at home um, and being able to care for their, their selves at home. So I call it digital at home or remote, remote patient monitoring uh, connected to their clinicians and others, others in their circle of care. Um, but as we know, people would like to you know, manage their health and if they do, if they are sick, be able to manage their uh, condition and or most of their journey um, at home and stay in their in their homes as long as they 
And so we're seeing a lot of interest in that. And where we're starting to see interest, and I think it'll take longer to actually see the benefits of this, is using AI and machine learning in drug discovery. So uh, pharma and um, you know researchers looking to reduce time to market and shortening tr clinical trials, really looking at for efficiencies and effectiveness. Um, in clinical trials. And so that's where we're starting, you know, to see the investment, but most of the investment we're seeing is in the, in, is in the imaging space right now. Aswin, did you have anything you wanted to add? Absolutely. So I, I definitely agree with what, uh, with what, what, what Karen has said. Uh, and in particular, I would echo the value that clinical decision support tools can and will continue to have in med tech. Um, you know, these tools, uh, I, I've seen the uptake of them uh, within my own portfolio, I have become vital for organizations that are seeking to improve care delivery, uh, it, given their ability to be able to improve diagnosis, treatment, prognosis of a particular medical condition, uh, being able to predict an outcome uh, or a certain risk of a certain disease, all using biomedical imaging data. And um, just in a particular use case that we have here uh, in a collaborative project that we're working on it with Vector uh, UHN and University of Waterloo, it allows for identification of pneumothorax and x-ray images, and it actually pinpoints an abnormality within them and then searches through thousands of historical images to be able to identify others that share the same characteristic. And, and we're also working on a detection model that can, that can uh, identify a case of a collapsed lung right away. And really what this use case shows is the potential to speed up a, a review process and reduce the time that it takes for treatment to be delivered to patients. And it's, it's virtually a, a second opinion for diagnostic purposes and it provides explanations for why that decision was made. Uh, and in cases like this, physicians can get a sense of like how the model has actually come to the conclusion. So I've seen this be a very popular approach and I think it will continue to be a popular approach because it does also uh, further emphasize how clinical decision support tools can be opportunities for augmenting uh, clinical care rather than replacing it. So Roz, you mentioned that you were going to concentrate on the quality improvement side so you can access the data. Do you see there's, there's kind of commercializability potential there? Yeah, lots. Because uh, what the projects that we're going to be working on are driven by clinical need primarily. So uh, research later, clinical need first. So um, we want to do things, or one of the things I want to build into our system is uh, monitoring how many patient interactions are involved in the tool, so we can say that this was involved in so many patient encounters. Um, instead of, you know, keeping track of how many times your paper is cited, I'd like to keep track of how many times your algorithm is actually used to impact clinical care and, and have that as a driving metric. So that's something we'd like to add to the system. But... Um, the other thing I think we should do is collaborate with small companies, and um, I'd like to build, um, a, I call it a training bunker, but it's a facility that would allow small Canadian companies to securely train their data behind the AHS firewall on um, a system that we have there. It's an academic system uh, with GPUs, so we can do deep learning, that will have uh, access to this data in a controlled uh, manner so that they could send their algorithm to us and train it and get the trained uh, model back out so we could help them get regulatory clearance and get through FDA and Health Canada. So I think that's something that uh, we're quite interested in. And then uh, and collaborating with them on those projects, but also I'm interested in doing things that small companies and even big companies like Google just can't do. And uh, that's because they don't have the expertise and they don't have access to the data, at least not on the scale that we're talking about. So one of my first uh, projects I'm trying to get going is I call it Google Search for Medicine. And um, this is using transformers and other technology to create fingerprints of everything, everything, absolutely everything from genetic tests to lab tests to notes to images and to run a batch job every night to encode every new piece of data that's acquired each day across the province and store those fingerprints in a database so that uh, non-experts can use those to construct models, but also we can do search. Um, and this is driven by years ago, I was watching a radiologist in Mayo Clinic in the reading room, and um, he was Googling and Googling for about 20 or 30 minutes. And usually a rat is really fast. They can get a, 
a diagnosis in two to five minutes. And this, this fellow, a friend of mine, was taking a long time. So I went over to him and said, what are you doing? And he said, this is a really tough case. I'm not sure what's going on. So I'm hoping somebody out there has published a case report that has images like this in it. And I said to myself, this is so wrong on so many levels. First of all, you're using words to search for images. You should be doing a semantic search, find an image that looks like this or a piece of this. And second of all, why are you searching on the internet when behind the firewall, you've got petabytes of images of some of the most difficult cases in the world attached to their outcomes? That's the database we should be searching is Mayo Clinic's umpteen years of, of radiology. And uh, applied multiple times to try and get funding for that and was turned down again and again and again. So it's been about a decade at least, I would say, since I first pitched building that. Uh, as far as I know, Mayo Clinic still does not have that capability. I hope Alberta will have it before they will, because I can build it here. But we want to go beyond images and do absolutely everything. So you can say, here, just draw a box and an image and say, find images that have a, a region that looks like this and up they come instantly. And then you fluently browse through those and find all the outcomes. And that, I mean, Google could do it, but they don't have the hospital data. A small company, they're not going to get access to all the data, right? So, mm -hmm. so I mean, that, that starts to impinge on the next question. But before we go on to our next question, I was just wondering if any of the audience had anything they wanted to add to that. So where, where do they see the sort of the low-hanging fruit? Is there any untapped area that we should be looking at? Trying to figure out how I can tell if anyone's put their hand up here with this weird system. Nope. Okay, so let's let's move on to the next question then. So so Ross, this was kind of an expansion of where you'd already started to go. So access to data is often seen as a challenge for companies wanting to work in this area. So you've already said that you're you're, you're trying to figure out how to get small companies behind the firewall. Do you have any advice for companies who aren't in Alberta, perhaps who who want to get a hold of access to data? Um, well, sure. We, I mean, we'd be happy to work with them as well. But if, if, so there's still some severe technical challenges to overcome with this. Um, just about two weeks ago, NVIDIA announced their confidential computing system. It's based on the new Hopper architecture. So we're look, that, that's a key piece. But another key piece is uh, that I haven't figured out yet is how do we ensure that some of these large models aren't just memorizing training data, right? Some of the new transformers that are trillions of parameters well, we don't have the infrastructure. Well, we could transfer learn, but how do you know that they're not just um, memorizing the training data, right? So uh, that, that's a key thing. Now, a lot of models, uh, especially for classification and prediction and not generative transformer models aren't gonna have that many parameters and just fundamentally won't be able to memorize much training data. So I'm comfortable working with them, but if somebody wanted to train or transfer learn on a GPT-3 or a Megatron, we'd have some reservations with that, I think. Um, but in theory, if we can figure that out, then anybody, you know, the goal would be to move your algorithm behind the firewall to the data and get it trained. Okay, and that's the way a lot of the challenges are going and things in the sort of research sector as well is, is take the algorithms in Docker containers and move them out. Um, Drew, did you want to, to put it butt in at this point? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. I'm just going to... Yeah, I, I just just had a question, a more general question about, I mean, it seems like a no-brainer to, you know, run a Google search on on images that are behind a firewall. Why, why was it, you mentioned it, um, it was difficult to get funding for that. Why, why was that? Uh, so, um, in my experience, um, a lot of imaging work is reviewed by engineers and physicists, and they are trained uh, to do deductive science. You start with a hypothesis, conduct experiments, and confirm or refute the hypothesis and repeat. Um, if you start mucking around in the data looking for patterns, um, that is heavily criticized. Now I've gotten this for 20 years, that this is not science. You're throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks. And so you write your grant to saying, well, it's hypothesis generating. We want to find patterns. And, and by the way, this is how GWAS works, genome-wide association studies. And this is how drugs are discovered now. Other fields have adapted to it, but it's just been incredibly difficult to get the engineers and the physicists to 
agree that inductive science is actually science. And it's highly complementary. It doesn't replace deductive science, of course. It's complementary to it. So that's the first thing. And then the other thing is that in healthcare, IT is just incredibly entrenched in doing what they continue to do, right? Um, and I saw this, a, a good, you, you can judge for yourself. The next time you're in a hospital, you're probably in the emergency department, so you're not really thinking about this, but take a look at the, the physician or the nurse who comes to interact with you and check, check and see if they have a beeper on their hip. I bet the chances are that they have a beeper on their hip and they have a cell phone in their pocket, right? They've got an iPhone in their pocket and a beeper on their hip and they hate it. They hate having to carry both devices around and they say continuously, why do I have to carry this damn beeper when I've got a cell phone? And the reason is because of the lack to, of incentive to change because there are systems out there now that do beeper technology on a cell phone app that have enormous advantages. And when I was talking about this with a fellow at Mayo Clinic in IT, he said, you know what, we've done the, it's even costs less per seat to have the cell phone app than it does to have the beepers because only hospitals use beepers now. So the cost per beeper is very high. And he says, we would actually save money, improve efficiency, improve outcomes. It's just, there's absolutely no reason not to do it. And they still carry beepers on their hip. So this is, you know, if you can't even get a hospital system to go with beepers, how are you going to get them to go with AI? I feel, I feel like we're getting a slightly off the topic of data here. So Karen, do you want to just um, follow on with this? On, on to uh, well, uh, you know, at a, at a higher level, what I find is there's still a, a bit of a trust issue between industry and our health service delivery and research. And so, um, you know, what I found is that there needs to be a common goal. And I, I love what uh, Ross said in terms of, you know, if we're positioning this as clinical decision support or, or for, to improve clinical quality improvement versus doing research, it, it may make a big difference in terms of getting access to the data. But the bottom line is this is data for good. Um, and data good for good has to be the underpinning objective. Um, and there has to be, you know, some guardrails in place in terms of making sure that the data is going to be used responsibly and, and ethically um, in terms of, of, of AI. I think some of the other challenges are, you know, being able to leverage data as an asset. And as I said, there's still this, this chasm sometimes between industry and, and uh, public sector and research in terms of, um, you know, seeing data as an asset and, and afraid of commercializing um, that data. Um, but, you know, this is new for most organizations. And as they work through their data sharing agreements, their intellectual property agreements, their commercial terms, you know, it, it's really eye opening. And there are some, you know, unique considerations, I would say, for Canadian businesses to be globally competitive and, and there's some challenges that need to overcome. So um, that's one of the challenges. And I think thirdly, you know, appropriate private and secure data storage share, sharing and use. I think one of the biggest concerns right now is cybersecurity. We hear about ransomware attacks all the time. And so I see those, um, you know, as challenges, but with every challenge, there's an opportunity, right? And so there's lots of opportunity to, um, address these things. There's there's organizations that have addressed them very confidently, and it's about sharing best practices. Um, and uh, you know, this is still an evolving field, but lots of room for sharing best practices um, and um, teaching each other. You know, I, I think as as Azra said, sort of, um, you know, sharing the learnings, sharing best practices, and um, and uh, doing this for good, like the population health data that Ross mentioned, this is all this is all going to result in better outcomes for Canadians. I know Vectra are doing quite a lot to try and facilitate data sharing. Do you want to chip in here? Yeah, I think maybe I'll approach this with uh, more sharing of an experience. Um, I mean, in our work, we, and you know, all of us can attest to the fact that there's really a need for high quality, timely data, specifically related to access to Canadian data. And one way that I've seen organizations overcome the, the access hurdle is really through collaboration. 
uh, and establishing a very strong framework for data sharing agreements. Now, obviously that sounds really easy and it's a lot harder in, in practice and, and it may take some time. Um, but if we look at collaborative collaborations, excuse me, that are already in place, such as Gemini, which collects administrative and clinical data from over 30 hospitals in Ontario, you can really see the power in investing in these types of collaborative agreements in order to really improve the way that insights from healthcare information is derived. And I mean, Gemini, we can look them up there. It, they're a very unique big data collaborative that supports quality improvement and research projects. So you have clinicians, you have researchers, you have data scientists, all working together to be able to generate novel insights about acute and chronic diseases and really highlight opportunities that hospitals can, can look towards in order to be able to make better decisions in terms of how to, uh, to uh, improve uh, offering safer care at, that's also more effective. And I really like what Karen said that data has to be, uh, and data for good has to be the overarching objective is what I think she mentioned. And I think investing in these types of collaboratives can allow for us to, to get the access to data, to generate the insights and insights, excuse me, and more importantly, make the correct operational and clinical decisions. Okay, thanks. I see Mark uh, Cicero has his uh, hand up. Do you want to chip in, Mark? Yes, hi, can you all hear me? Yep. Perfect. Uh, great discussion. Uh, just wanted to hear the panelists' thoughts on things around reimbursement. And, you know, it's great that uh, we can develop this cutting edge algorithm and, and it can actually be beneficial for patients. But unfortunately, uh, from what I've seen, that's not sufficient all the time. And we really need to align incentives. And healthcare is very fragmented in those incentives. So, uh, just curious to know if anyone has any thoughts on, on how to do that best. And um, like, for example, one hypothesis I have is that uh, these, these payer providers who are incentivized from, from both angles are some of the earlier adopters. And, and maybe the best example we have in Canada is Alberta Health as, as, um, as the, the government, but also having access to the data. Uh, so I'm just curious to know, I know in the US, it's a bit more, more fragmented, but you have pockets of, of those payer providers. And so uh, just curious to know if, if there's any thoughts on, on those dynamics. Anyone want to take that? I mean, Karen, you're this kind of involved with industry. So I wonder if you've got any experience in that with the companies you work with. You're on mute at the moment, Karen. Thank you. I had to be the first one today. <laughs> Um, you know, there's a, I think there's a couple of different angles in, when you talk about reimbursement. So first of all, from a, you know, um, service delivery point of view, what Azra said in terms of this is a clinical decision support tool um, that is going to help clinicians uh, make decisions faster, better, um, and faster and better, um, you know, is really important. And so it's not intended to replace uh, a clinical decision, but to help the clinician um, make a decision. And therefore, I, I don't think there's any change in reimbursement from that perspective. Um, uh, you know, I think when you get into reimbursement for the use of data, that's a new and evolving field. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, trust that needs to be there. And as I mentioned, you know, gets complex in terms of, you know, who's going to own it, who's going to manage it, and how do you ensure that it's high quality data? Um, are, and that's where all the IP and, and commercial terms discussions uh, happen, but it's happening. And as I said, we've got over, I think over 40 projects now where there's um, an, an ang like industry driven, right? So they're looking uh, to commercialize their algorithms. Um, and there's also always an element of you know, who owns the, the patient owns their clinical data, they're stewards of data, but then there's the people who are labeling it and, and um, uh, you know, up the value chain and, you know, who, who's going to get a cut of the pie if the algorithm gets used in a commercial setting are always interesting conversations and there's different models and they're evolving. Um, but, you know, and then on the research side, uh, you know, it's what's the value of the data in terms of being able to shorten a, a, a clinical trial, for example. Um, it, those are on a case-by-case -case basis now, 
Um, but to Azra's point, I think there's some models that are starting to develop and um, may become uh, practices that 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 others are going to be willing to adopt. So uh, I think it's a good question mark, um, and there's no single answer at this point in time. And it it, it does um, certainly make access to data uh, more challenging. But the 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 point is, you if you have the common goal, you know you want to use the data for good. You've got this vision. Um, it's it's about you know having those conversations up front. Um, and um, making sure everybody's on the same page. I mean, this really is, is very related to the next question I had on the list anyway, so I'll go straight into that. So, I mean, researchers in academia and industry, we've already developed a lot of AI applications for healthcare. So there's a lot of research out there. There's many big papers in nature, medicine, et cetera, on these fantastic AI algorithms, but relatively few are in the market uh, or in the clinic at the moment. So, so my kind of query was, what do you see as the main barriers to adoption and how do we overcome these? So this is kind of related to reimbursement as well. So Azra, did you want to take the, the first stab at this one? Yeah, and I'm laughing because I honestly could probably speak for a full hour on this topic because it's a big one. <laughs> um, and something that many of us are facing, but I'll try and express it, uh, my thoughts in just a few minutes. Um, but really, I think the, the way I could start this off by is by saying that Healthcare is made up of socio-technical systems, okay? So you have people, you have technology, you have culture, infrastructure, rules, processes, everything. So it really makes integration and implementation overall very difficult. So just to, to set the stage with that. And then when you're developing, developing and implementing machine learned tools, it requires resources that can be difficult to access, which we've spoken about, which is access to large real-time clinical data sets. And I know that this is a number of issues that our researchers face, which makes it very difficult for them to develop localized solutions and then you know, move on to the implementation phase. Uh, and even when we're able to take the research and translate it into something tangible, it requires technical skills in data science, it requires compute power, it re requires uh, clinical informatics infrastructure. So th there are a lot of, um, barriers that, that people often face at, at the time of implementation. Uh, and then additionally, introducing anything new, especially within uh, you know, a lot of the work that we do is within hospitals, does require a cultural change. It requires a shift in the behavior and mindset. Um, and, and that said, to be, to be frank, education to inform our health service providers in this area is limited. And low acceptance of machine learning solutions by clinicians uh, and uncertainty about how to evaluate them are some of the key reasons for slow uptake of, of AI in healthcare. And I think it was in a recent um, journal that was published by the Canadian Medical Association. Uh, it states that one of, one of the barrier, largest barriers to adoption is whether or not clinicians trust it. Do they really trust the model's output? And when real health outcomes are on the line, they, they have concerns about trusting a model and knowing about its robustness and its complexity, and, and it can lead to a lot of unease. And, and you know, what we've seen is that mar, model performances can change. And in fact, they degrade over time, often due to changes in the data, be it changes in demographic, behaviors, diseases, COVID, uh, huge variations in the data. So there has to be the appropriate education and support that's in place in order for these solutions to be properly implemented and monitored over time. And, I think because we're still figuring out what, how to, to implement them and monitor them over time, it has led to a slower uptake of some of these, uh, some of these solutions. Yeah, I feel like we need to involve some of the professional, I mean, things, you know, some of the companies, for example, working with physiotherapists or working with the radiation oncologists and, and the radiation therapy uh, technologists and things. We need to work with people that are much earlier in the development of the AI technology so that we know that the, the people who are on the ground actually delivering healthcare services are actually on board with what they're doing. I mean, down to what Ross was saying about having pages in your pocket, if they can't even adjust to that, then how are they going to adjust to an AI solution? Ross, did you want to follow on with this particular question about adoption? Sure. So um, the approach that I've taken again is to move the research team behind the firewall. And um, so what I've done in the past, uh, for example, we uh, delivered a, an algorithm to predict sepsis and bone marrow transplant patients at Moffitt. And uh, we're on the clinical side, quality improvement side. So th that takes care of data access, but then you still have all those other issues. So um, uh, my team attended the 
bi-weekly meeting with the nurses who actually um, dealt with the sepsis patients, the patients had sepsis, and there's one uh, key nurse whose job it was was to track sepsis in the hospital. And uh, we also went to the monthly quality meetings where sepsis was a big topic. And we got to know the nurses on the ward, the infectious disease docs who treated it. And uh, we also had IT guys in, in the group as well. And so we, this, the model isn't we build it and chuck it over the fence. It's an iterative thing where, you know, I say we want to break things frequently and often and learn from our mistakes. And we want to get feedback from the floor right away. So uh, we, we sort of converged on a particular um, solution, as you will, that didn't have any AI in it at all, but that's neither here nor there. But uh, we built a tool that looked like, well, the, the nurses found it very useful. And implementation at that point was pretty straightforward because we've been working with them for a year. We had the IT guys on. So it was a matter of figuring out where to put it and where to, where to put the display. But then you still have issues because uh, this may be more American than Canadian, but if you produce a metric or a value that is critical for decision making, um, someone has to be legally responsible for receiving that information and acting on it. If they don't, you have a liability. And if that's the case, you're better off not producing the metric at all. So if you produce something that predicts sepsis and nobody acts on it, you can expose yourself to huge suits in the US. So you don't want to even produce that metric. So you have to have a team that knows where to look and knows what to do when they get that piece of information. And the other thing that we did uh, was to, we always were running things in silent mode. I like to do implementation science. So you try and measure the baseline if you can, then the effect of the intervention of adding this tool, and then you measure the outcome. And um, so during that measurement phase for the, the sepsis tool, we're gonna have to run it in silent mode for a year to get enough statistics to prove that it was actually doing something. And that involves um, running the thing every night and then once a month sitting down with the docs and the nurses and going back over the predictions to see how it did. And this gives them a chance to build confidence in the algorithm. So um, it's a process, right? It's not just like they're comfortable if they buy something and plug it in and turn it on. And that's what they tried with sepsis in this case and the algorithms didn't work. So they came to us and said, can you build something? And that pro it's a process. It takes a long time and you have to be on the front line and on the right side of the firewall. Karen, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I, you know, building off what uh, uh, Azra's comments, it, it comes down to trust um, and adoption is all about trust. And so, uh, you know, the combination of, you know, do I believe the, the, the recommendation um, that is being given to me from the AI tool, I think the transparency um, and the explanation uh, takes some time to get used to it. Um, but once people trust it, they, they, they will feel more comfortable actually uh, using it. Um, and the other two points that I have is it is about education. You know, so we have a couple of our, our, um, our projects that actually have are working with some of the professional colleges around education and around trust and being able to support some of this adoption in both the colleges and in the curriculum, um, you know, continuing ed as well as uh, medical school or, or the clinical uh, colleges. Um, the other thing is digital literacy. Um, and I think as you mentioned that as well, you know, there's still, there's still a number of clinicians who don't feel very comfortable just using digital tools at all, never, you know, an EMR or an iPad or, or you know, basics, but never mind um, artificial intelligence. So all of those things have to be there to enable uh, the the use of AI um, and the adoption of AI. And you know, one without one of the other elements isn't going to work. So it, it truly is a multifaceted. Um, uh, challenge that, uh, you know, it, they all of the pieces of the puzzle need to be there. Um, you'll get your early adopters, you'll always get your early adopters, but, um, and those that are willing to participate in the R&D, but the, the wide scale adoption takes more to change management exercise. Mm -hmm. Humans are humans. <laughs> Right, so I'm, I'm conscious of um, time going fast here, so we're into our last 15 minutes. 
So before I go on to the last prepared question, which is all about um, responsible AI and fairness, does anyone have any other questions from the floor that I'd like to ask the panel? Going, going, gone. Okay, so I'll, I'll move into the, the last question I have here then. So there's a growing need, growing awareness of the need for responsible about AI that's fair and transparent. So we've already touched on some of those aspects. And, and in the healthcare sector, explainability, human centeredness, and privacy and security are important concerns. So, how can the med tech sector particularly ensure that it follows these guiding principles? So, Asma, do you want to go first on this one? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, I think because of AI's novelty and its complexity and the fact that it changes rapidly, uh, the standards for managing fairness and risk and, and trade-offs between performance and trans transparency are still pretty unsettled. Um, so, uh, you know, my thought is that we should be continuously looking at the thought leadership in this area uh, because that's fundamental to, to how we approach uh, machine learning machine learning solutions. Um, and I know that, that Vector in particular is, is collaborating with like-minded groups, such as the schwartz Reisman Institute, excuse me, as well as a number of our industry sponsors, such as Roche, uh, EY, and others to advance thought leadership on responsible AI and develop recommendations for standards and practices. And it's really from these collaborations uh, that we can start to understand what are some of the standards of, of privacy and fairness for AI-related use cases. And I'll, I'll share some of the, the principles that have been identified from some of those discussions, uh, specifically as it relates to uh, oversight uh, of projects, as well as when, when there's the actual execution and, and things that you, know, you might want to consider along your journeys. And the first is at the onset, there has to be a discussion and creation of an operational definition of what fairness and privacy are. So I'd say that, that that's probably the first principle. And, and the second is developing accountability standards for who should be responsible uh, for ensuring that fairness and privacy, um, you know, whether it's uh, somebody from your legal side, your privacy or compliance or an executive uh, is really monitoring that definition and, and, and measuring it. Uh, and then the third from an oversight perspective is, is model explainability. So really um, developing robust explainability is key to understanding how models should be improved over time. So uh, I think that from the oversight perspective, those are those are principles that, that, that should be followed. And then from an execution perspective, defining your metrics uh, that can be used to assess the level of privacy and bias within a model is, is key. And then having the right skills to engage in this work. I think that you know, a lot of us didn't necessarily learn too much about ethics and privacy in, in, in recent curriculum. I think it's starting to be brought up more, but developing these skills is, is effective uh, to implementing fairness and privacy within AI model development, and it's actually quite crucial. So I would say that from an operational and, and execution perspective, those are probably some principles that, that I, would, I would follow. And actually, sorry, just thinking about one other thing is there's a lot of potential in the privacy enhancing technologies as well. And, and you know, they can unlock uh, a value in sharing data without actually compromising uh, on privacy and confidential, confidentiality of data. So uh, another key point that, that can help along this journey. Karen, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I would say, you know, industry right now, when it when it develops their AI for commercial uh, purposes, really relies on the health tech approval processes right now to provide um, them guidance as to the minimum requirements uh, around, uh, you know, what's, what's necessary to get approval. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. So I would say, you know, regulation, um, you know, is evolving. There's regulation in some countries. And I know that there's a lot of effort being put into the Canadian context right now around regulation, around AI that will provide really strict guardrails. Like, like that's the, the, the outer boundary. Um, and, you know, cor corporations want to be seen as good citizens who care about social goods. So, you know, the, the, the CSR and the ESG sort of requirements that, that organizations have, they want to do good. They want to be uh, seen in that, and they'll produce evidence to, to provide um, assurances to their customers and to their constituents that they really are being ethical and responsible in the use of data. But there's already robust frameworks out there, uh, as were mentioned. Some, you know, the OECD has a set of principles around uh, responsible AI. 
you know, I'm, I, I'm doing work with Microsoft. They have a lot of work around uh, responsible AI and actually one of the projects that we have, and as, a, as a, I would say is a, is a best practice is having an ethics committee as part of their governance structure um, that, you know, brings in independent ethicists, brings in experts, you know, not, not, there's no conflict of interest with the people who are developing the tech, but bringing outside experts in um, so that there is proper governance and independent views on how the data is being used and assurances around those sets of principles that get agreed to and the requirements uh, to make sure that, that they're building confidence in the user community and in the um, you know the in the ecosystem at overall about how that data is being used, how the algorithms are being used, and uh, the impacts and outcomes um, are are again what's going to speak. You know, demonstrating health you know improvements to health outcomes and demonstrating how the, this data and this work is being used for good at both the population level and at, at a uh, patient level, I think over time is going to be really what, what uh, people are looking for. Great. Ross, did you have anything well, else? Not, not, not much really. I think um, so part of the privacy issue uh, we deal with by trying to move behind the firewall to do all our research, um, but there's still privacy issues that we have to address. But the ethics, that, the, that doesn't go away because you're behind the firewall. In fact, it's probably amplified because you have access to more data. So, um, it, and the fairness is, uh, and bias is really, really tough. My goodness. Um, if we knew about it, we would get rid of it, right? So it's, how do you stop something that you don't know exists? So I think it's really important to have like social scientists and people who are experts in these fields involved in these projects. And I like the idea of an external body that um, probes models that we train. I believe we should be actively probing trained models to see if we can pull bias out of them. Like, let's say we train a model to predict whether a, a, a smoker is going to be readmitted in 30 days. Once you're done training, now try and use that model to predict whether the smoker is male or female. It should get 50-50. If it doesn't, there's something up, right? Or predict, uh, predict their gender or their sex or something like that. Um, so I don't think we should take it for granted that these are fair. I think we should have active probing and testing of these models to see if we can pull predictions out that we know are sensitive in nature. Right. But uh, it's tough. It's really tough. Important work. Certainly an area of, of much research as well. Raphael, I can see you have your hand up there. Um, I just uh, I have a, a bit of a pragmatic question. So uh, a, a common question that we at Innovate get from industry partners is, I, as an industry partner, have a great idea. I have an algorithm. I need data. I need collaborators. And who, who, should, I, who should I talk to? And uh, truth be told, we generally come up a little empty. And so my question for, for the three of you is, are we seeing organization, what organizations and groups are taking more of a leadership role? Um, and what advice do you have for, for companies who have applications but need, need the data, need, need the collaborations, how to, to approach that and who to approach? Well, that's my day job. <laughs> Matchmaking, right? <laughs> Industry partners coming together with the uh, with academia coming together with public sector. That's the magic, and and it really is about magic because it's not just about finding data. It's about finding collaborators, and it's all about the people, and it's all about you know people trusting each other. And so it, it you know it, it, there there needs to be common vision. You know there needs to be common purpose. Um, and um, introducing people that have those common goals is what I spend my time doing. And there, you know, we've got 56 research institutes from across the country working on projects with us. We have health systems from across the country. We have private and public uh, health service delivery organizations. And we have, you know, 
t- uh, lots of, of industry partners. So it's about knowing who your who your market is. It's about knowing who your customers are. You know, it's knowing about what's important, not only to them, but, you know, what are the secret ingredients um, to that recipe? And it's not just about imaging data. So I really like what Ross is saying, right? It's about bringing the imaging data together with the clinical data, with the administrative data, so that you have that holistic view of patients and can mine the data um, across that. And, And it has to come from multiple sources. And, you know, there are some technical issues, but you know we've got we've got companies that um, you know are trusted with data that are using federated models, so the data doesn't have to move, um, and um, you know really doing fantastic things with them. So um, it it is about networking, and it is about knowing you know who's doing what and knowing your market from an industry perspective. Anyone got something quickly to add? And then we can go on to a question from Brian. So as we're trying to quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Karen, I I like the way you put it, that that's your day job. But also what I would say, uh, you know, at the Vector Institute, I'd like to think of us as like that bridge between like the ideas and between the implementation and being able to also, you know, introduce you to, to our network and our community to try and bring these, you know, amazing ideas forward. And we have researchers that work in, in a variety of areas. I mean, and like, you know, imaging, cancer, genomics, um, you name it. And so I think that once you're able to uh, understand how to, to, you know, utilize the AI community and utilize this network and, and potentially like use, uh, you know, digital supercluster or vector as a bridge to be able to, to meet those individuals, uh, you'll have more of an opportunity to, to, to know who to go to or who to speak to, so. And that would just be my advice. Anything super quick, Ross, or shall I go to Brian and ask his question? Oh, I would just say the same thing. Uh, Amy in Alberta is in a similar position. Yeah. Hey, Brian, do you want to ask the last question of the session? Well, I think, uh, you know, curious about one thing. So there are jurisdictions in the world where you can get pretty open access to a lot of data that doesn't have anywhere near the level of privacy protection and security protection. Etc. That that you as citizens of this country would want, right? So <clears throat> there are other people that have access to the kind of data that maybe a lot of these companies want. What stops companies in a very capitalistic kind of way of saying, "Hey, we're just going to go and get that data and move on and skip all of the uh, check boxes that would happen in a more proctored and governed environment such as Canada?" Um, and um, you know, kind of curious because there is going to be in any sort of commercial activity, there is a risk of a race to the bottom. On the flip side, when you are in a group that has proper governance, proper completeness, and proctoring of the data, then maybe it's more valuable data. It's better in the first place, and it's more legitimately commercializable with fewer restrictions once it is developed when it goes elsewhere. But you know, this area, yeah, this I'm almost looking like this as a as a group that. that um, maybe should talk with Raphael and Dan and myself about a data trust working group. But um, what do people uh, on this panel or in the audience think about that race to the bottom risk versus uh, a properly governed with the right check boxes, but actually moves at a pace that gets done and doesn't like stagnate to death? It's an interesting question, but but what I hear is that you know Canada as a has a reputation. Um, for uh, being a country that is very, very interested in social good and um, can be trusted. And so, it, again, it all comes down to trust and, um, you know, wanting to work with organizations and with data um, and that have good processes around trust. And so um, I think Canada has the opportunity to shine, to be a shining star um, when it comes to data trust and the responsible and ethical use of AI and building off of the, te- the, the technical, you know, expertise and research that, that this country has. Um, because my question would be, you know, the race to the bottom, are people really going to trust those uh, companies that are, that are chasing that data? I would add, would you trust the models? Because yeah. what we're seeing is models that are trained by, let's say, Epic, and uh, they turn them on here in Alberta and they don't work. And they think, well, why didn't they work? They're supposed to work. And it turns out they're trained. uh, Epic got the data from a high profile, large academic center in the US. 
and their patient demographic is nothing like the patient demographic in Canada where we have a public health care system. So if your data is trained from Mayo or Hopkins or Cleveland, um, chances are it may not work very well in downtown Toronto. Mm -hmm. True. Well, and hopefully we will avoid the race to the bottom. And, and as Brian says, maybe we should, between us, start thinking about taking some kind of, of leading role in, in ensuring you know, that, that we can service the, the med tech industry by helping to interact with researchers, provide access to data and so on. We have sort of, sort of a forum for trying to make that possible. So it'd be exciting to try that in the future. Anyway, I think we're up, up at time now. So I'd like to thank my panelists very much indeed. It's a, a great discussion, uh, very enjoyable. So thanks again for your input here. And I shall hand back control to Raphael. Great. Well, well, and let me let me start by thanking you for running a, a great panel. And uh, for panelists, uh, let me thank all the, all the speakers today. Um, of course, the uh, the government of funding of Canada for providing the the funding for Innovate. Uh, thank everybody for uh, giving uh, some of their time today to uh, to engage in these discussions and and see what is going on across Canada in the image guided therapy and AI spaces. Uh, also, uh, like to again thank. Uh, my team who, who put this meeting together, in particular, uh, Ahmed Nassif, who, uh, who is uh, solely responsible for uh, constantly spamming you so that you attend the session. So uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to, to Leo as well um, and uh, Teresa. So uh, a couple of, uh, of last points. Uh, so one, uh, there will be an exit survey sent to everyone. Again, I ask you to fill it out uh, because, as I said earlier, uh, we really uh, want to do activities that, uh, that add value. And so uh, please let us know what was of use today, what wasn't, and then that will inform uh, future meetings. Again, hopefully future meetings are at least uh, partially uh, in person. Um, as I think we're, we're, we're all a little tired of, uh, of Zoom. Uh, finally, uh, you know, I'll remind you again that uh, we have the kind of one-on-one -on -one networking uh, structure uh, set up online. I think the, uh, the link was, was posted in, in the chat a little bit earlier. And so if there is anybody who you saw present today who you'd like to reach out to, um, if you want kind of first access to, uh, to Leo to get insight on or feedback on your idea for an application for the Focus Fund. Uh, this is uh, kind of a, a unique opportunity for that. Um, outside of that, uh, let me thank everybody again for coming and uh, wish everybody a, a great day and uh, kind of a, wish you a great weekend uh, uh, early. Um, and then let me just ask Leo or Ahmed, did I, did I miss anything? Okay. Wonderful. Uh, well, then, uh, with that, uh, have a good day, and uh, we'll end the meeting now.